Hi there, my name is Maria Lewis. I'm assistant curator at ACME, the Australian Centre for Moving Image, and I'm so delighted to be joined by David France, award-winning documentarian, investigative journalist, and the filmmaker behind the breathtaking Welcome to Chechnya. Thank you so much for joining us, David. Well, thanks for having me, Maria. I'm glad to be here. Firstly, it feels very strange to say, wow, I love this film so much because I don't want to undermine the seriousness of the content and the subject matter at all, but it is an incredible historical document and a very brave piece of journalism, not just from yourself and your team, but from the people that are featured in the film. So firstly, I want to congratulate you on that. And secondly, I would love to know how did you first hear about the situation in Chechnya? When did that news first start trickling through to you? Well, I, first of all, um, it's great to be here and thank you for featuring the film like this, which is such an honor. Um, I think that there, uh, I'm not surprised that you feel like you love the film because the, it's really the people who are in the film who, who like, like to, I don't know, earn um, love and respect in a way that's so unusual. I mean, the work that they're doing and the way that they're doing that work is just inspiring and it just, it just wedges open your heart, I think. And certainly it did mine. You know, I first heard about what was happening in Chechnya in early 2017, in, in uh, April of 2017, when, um, when uh, an investigative reporter in a Russian newspaper broke open the story about the, the genocide against the LGBTQ community in the Southern Republic of Chechnya. And, um, uh, and, uh, and I didn't feel called to tell the story right away until um, a number of months later, an another report circulated. And this one was about the work that ordinary Russian LGBTQ activists were taking on themselves, incredible superhuman kind of work to, to rescue people and to build this vast network of, um, of underground safe houses and uh, you know pipelines and and secret routes to get people out of the republic um, to rescue them actually physically by hand in many instances get them into these safe houses and 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 spirit them even out of Russia and into um, countries where they might be able to hide even deeper from this campaign because it's a campaign of of liquidation. It's, it, it's been described by the leader of Chechnya as a, uh, a blood cleansing campaign where they're actually attempting in this um, uh, uh, just you know, criminal and bizarre way to uh, perversely to try to eliminate all LGBTQ Chechens from the bloodline of this ethnic minority. And, uh, and so when I read about the, the activism, I thought that's that's the story I need to go and tell. I need to help them. I need to um, bring their story to the world. And that, that's what drafted me into this mission. Yeah, that's so fascinating to hear because I think over the past several decades, your work and your voice has really become one of the preeminent ones, at least for me personally, on global LBGTQI plus issues throughout the world. And you know, you've covered everything from the AIDS crisis to um, mass sexual abuse within the Catholic Church. And I really did wonder, like, what was it about the story that made you compelled to tell it and to dedicate the next few years of your life to it and to put yourself at great risk as well? That is my next question is, how were you able to I don't know if manage is the right word, but how were you able to liaise security, not just with your production when you were physically shooting, but as well in post, because you are disguising the identities of so many people in the movie? Well, it's such a good question, because when we started on the project, we had to promise that we would do nothing that would make anything any worse mm. for the people who were doing this work. We discovered to make, you know? We, right, we, we knew it was going to be a problem um, of strategy and security and to, to find ways to enter these secret networks and to leave the secret networks um, safely without revealing their locations, without um, you know, inadvertently tripping the, the, the guide wires up that might bring a, you know, a terrible reaction that could be fatal to anybody who's in that, uh, involved in that network. Um, and then once we started filming with the people who had survived this 
this, this regime of horror in Chechnya, we discovered that they needed to protect their anonymity for the rest of their lives, that we had to find ways to, to protect them even uh, after we left those, those, those uh, underground systems. And, um, and that meant we had to protect the footage, making sure that when we brought footage out of the safe houses, that it was encrypted that in ways that could never be unencrypted, that even if we lost control of our drop hard drives, that we would not lose control of the identities of locations, et cetera. Um, uh, the cameras that we used, which were not professional film cameras, they were consumer uh, grade cameras. We were writing over the, the, the cards in the cameras, not just deleting them, but writing uh, blank information over the top of them so that there's no process through which that information could be retrieved if we lost any of those cards. And then just bringing all the footage back to New York and realizing that we had to go to extreme lengths to protect uh, the footage. And that meant that we built an air-gapped uh, edit suite where none of the footage that I brought back ever touched a computer that ever touched the internet. We knew that uh, Russia has the capacity to you know, um, you know to hack into computer systems, uh, and ours certainly was not sophisticated enough to put up you know firewalls against that. So we just stayed off the internet. We never moved the footage across the internet. We di we didn't network anything in the in the office. We didn't allow internet connected devices in the studio. The for example, cell phones were 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 barred. Um, computers that had internet were not allowed in, you know, Google watches, you know, anything that might give the uh, potential, um, you know, uh, uh, weakness to our system. Um, and then it wasn't until after we had finished this disguise work that it took us almost a year to complete, that we showed the film to anybody, even for consideration in uh, film festivals, et cetera. Um, so we were, we were very careful about living up to this promise that we made to everybody. And there are 23 people in the film who are, um, whose lives are that imperiled that their identities needed to be guarded with that kind of uh, care that we put up for this. That's so fascinating to hear because obviously I think so much of the conversation and rightly so is around the deep fake technology, but it's really interesting to hear those practical um, did, like that practical implementation of just not even having computers in the studio connected to the internet. It's absolutely mind boggling and incredible and, and very smart, both on a practical level and like a post-production level as well. And cumbersome, right? So, you know, usually what filmmakers take their, their footage and they send them out to transcription mills, if you, uh, which we couldn't do, we couldn't send the footage out any place. Or if you're going to undertake a VFX um, uh, project in your film, as we did, it's typically sent to, you know, rotoscoping farms in India and places where the prices are good and but there is no security and we couldn't do any of that. We had to do all of that stuff in house in New York. We built a transcribing studio. We built a VFX studio, a rotoscoping studio. We stood up all of these enterprises uh, on our own just to make sure that we could control access, we could control the numbers of people and the individuals. We did background vetting on anybody that we brought in to work on the project. As you can imagine, we brought in a lot of people who were Russian because it's in Russian language. So we made sure that we knew who those people were and that they were safe, that they weren't, um, they didn't have any potential to be a kind of double agent to, um, which was of, of, of utmost concern for us. And then to really control everything about the project, including the fact that we were even doing the project mm. because I kept flying in and out of Russia um, as, as a you know, tourist, which is, I was you know, posing as a tourist. No one knew that I was making this film. And had they known, they might have been able to follow me and, um, and kind of break through the secrets of the network. Definitely, I mean, just the, <laughs> The frequency of the word transcription mentioned is giving me traumatic flashbacks to being a police reporter. And, um, and I'm curious how your skills as an investigative journalist, whether that's dealing with primary sources or fact checking, did you feel like those were really, like they came into full use and full display on a film like Welcome to Chechnya because it wasn't just about 
crafting the narrative of the story you're trying to document, but all of those practical things on the ground as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of it was work that I had never, um, challenges I had never encountered before. I had never worked in Russia. I didn't know. I've worked in, in um, governments, in countries with governments that are totalitarian and um, sophisticated, but none as uh, um, digitally uh, adept as Russia. Uh, so that was very concerning. Um, you know, and you know this, uh, uh, the first tool of any good reporter um, is the tool of, of gaining confidence and gaining trust. Um, and that was the, the first threshold for this project was to, to convince people that I was uh, committed and on their side and that I was um, capable of uh, maintaining these security standards that we discussed and developed together along the way. Um, but then I learned that the people who survived their torture, um, all of them said that their torture had been filmed. And, um, and while the, all the news had circled the globe about what's happening in Chechnya, the government in Chechnya and Putin's government and, and the Kremlin have both denied that this is happening at all. They say there is no evidence. And, and then when I realized that they had been gathering this evidence, you know, almost across the board, we began the work to, with the activists, to uncover that uh, physical evidence, the forensic evidence of the crimes that are being committed there by the officials and the security forces. Um, and that led us to um, uh, finding sources that shared with us um, some uh, really atrocious pieces of, of uh, proof about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and, um, and, uh, and makes it entirely impossible for them to continue denying that this is going on. So we, we wanted to make sure that this was not just a story about the activism, which we think is very important, um, but also a story that gives the activists a tool that they can use to continue raising alarms about what's happening there. Because it's still going on, you know, we're into year four now of this campaign. And, uh, and it so far has generated, you know, some diplomatic pressure on Russia to do something about it, but not sufficient, not sufficient to stop it. And certainly not sufficient to the scope of the campaign itself. Yeah, I think that's what's so interesting about the footage that you've chosen and the clips that you've chosen and the parts of the clips that you choose. Like it, it's a very conscious choice, but it does a great job to show rather than tell the sheer scale of the genocide that is happening there, which I think is one of the hardest things going into this film for the audience to grapple with. And you just have such a, an amazing collection of clips of, of people suffering, suffering these terrible atrocities in Chechnya. And then also, I think that the, the, those forensic clips, I think, help understand, help you understand, help us understand why there's such a, um, a gravity etched in the faces of the people who survived that. Why they, they reflect such fear in every frame of the film. They're carrying with them the knowledge that we now get through that footage because that's what happened to them. And that's the, those are the stakes in, in every moment of that, of what I experienced during my time embedded with them. Those are the stakes and those stakes are horrible uh, and they are without limit. My last question for you, David, is um, what is the last great piece of nonfiction that you've consumed, whether it's, a documentary or uh, a feature article? What is uh, the last great piece of nonfiction that's really popped up on your radar? Well, it's funny that you should ask that. Last night, I finally watched a documentary that I haven't seen yet from this past year called The Truffle Hunters. Oh, love that film. I, I don't know why I put it off. I think I put it off because I was, I was waiting to have something that I could just purely enjoy. Mm. And I loved it. It was just so evocative and um, colorful and soulful. It had such a soul. And uh, uh, I just, 
I'm I'm so glad I got a chance to spend some time with those characters and and I yeah. would recommend it to anybody. <laughs> yeah, it's a remarkable film. I recommend it as well. David Frant, thank you so much for joining us. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And well, thank you, Maria. it's so marvelous. So again, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And thanks for including the film. I really appreciate it. Oh.